I feel I'm here a little bit under false pretenses in a, in a session that's entitled Science and Gaps. Um, but I, I'll do my best to uh, be at least the modestly entertaining, although um, I, I'm really depending on Mark to, uh, to carry the day. So I'm going to talk about Into the Lion's Den, my experience with third-party payers and molecular diagnostics, something that I had really very little to do until a little over a year ago when I um, became a volunteer faculty at UCSF and became CMO at Invitae. So uh, disclaimer, disclosures, I am a full-time employee. And I get salary and stock options from this company, and the opinions I express here are based on my own experience. They're my own, and they don't necessarily reflect those in Vitae. Um, I'm, I'm always interested in um, the following issue, which is anecdotes as data. You can actually find both comments. The plural of anecdote is data. That was Raymond Wolfinger at Stanford Graduate Seminar in 1969. Or the plural of anecdote is not data, and that's a Bernstein, Metaphor, Cognitive Belief, and Science paper that he published. So take your pick. But as of today, um, I'm going to go on the left, which is the plural of anecdote is data. I'm going to be telling you some anecdotes. So the first is the third party payers are not monolithic. And each payer creates uh, its own policies. Uh, and this has to be spread out among a number of different payers. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time recently with Medicare. But there are also large private payers, as you know, United Healthcare and Aetna. There are many blues, large and small. Some were acquired and therefore belong to a larger umbrella blue, but still retain some autonomy. Some are independent, and you really have to deal with each of them on an individual basis. Then, of course, there's state Medicaid, there's managed Medicaid, there's the federal blues, and it goes on and on. So there's lots of different, uh, lots of different payers, and um, they are very heterogeneous in their outlook on genetics, on their knowledge and sophistication. So, Moldy X, which is a very important component uh, of this, is a uh, process that was set up, and it's an organization, it's a group that was set up originally by Palmetto, which is one of the MACs, one of the Medicare contractors. Um, and Moldy X uh, has been very much involved in evaluating genetic testing and making decisions about whether or not uh, there is evidence that would make it. Um, reasonable to support uh, diagnostic testing. But MoldyX doesn't dictate to most insurers, but it does wield a lot of influence, uh, sort of like the Pied Piper here. So when it comes to molecular genetic testing, most payers do play follow the leader with MoldyX. What does MoldyX do? It reviews evidence concerning whether to cover genetic tests. It's directed by Dr. Elaine Jeter. Uh, who um, is a very knowledgeable uh, person, acknowledged in the field uh, as, as um, being an expert in this area. Uh, but it's, I find it sort of interesting that to have almost a single group like Moldy X and even a single individual in that group to be so, st to so strongly personify what we view as being a sort of a national, a national issue. And it, MoldyX grew out of the work of Palmetto GBA, which is a subsidiary of Blue Cross Blue Shield, but it's also the Medicare administrative contractor um, in the uh, southeast US. So when it comes to them, um, most players do follow the leader. Noridian, which is another MAC, took over the jurisdiction on the west coast, where I am, California, Nevada, Hawaii, and Pacific territories. And Noridian tends to be a very close um, follower of what Moldy X does. Uh, other MACs also look there, but they make their own local coverage decisions. And so it's not necessarily a, uh, a completely snap thing. Um, and many private insurers also look to Moldy X for guidance. But as I'm sure you're aware, and it's an important point to make, um, Medicare only covers affected individuals and not unaffected individuals at risk. So a lot of what we think about in the use of genomics for risk assessment, for cascade testing in a family, um, in addition, of course, to the age or disability requirements to be covered by Medicare, you also, ha also have to be affected. And so um, no matter how good a job uh, something like Moldy X does, it's still not going to cover uh, the, num the people that we are also interested in thinking about, and that is unaffected people who are at risk. 
Um, so, uh, for example, when Moldex uh, just recently looked at and approved uh, a new, for payment, a new code for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer done as a panel by next generation sequencing, as opposed to the previous uh, coverage, which was uh, for a different methodology, they looked, uh, we, we applied from our company, we applied for uh, Medicare coverage for this, which was accepted. And they asked us to submit a lot of analytical validity data. They wanted to know that the next generation sequencing approach was going to work and was going to be equal or better than what had been done previously. They wanted to know what uh, the clinical interpretation of the data was uh, and whether um, uh, our lab uh, had reasonable concordance with other laboratories. And of course, they wanted to know if we used ClinVar was an important component of what they looked at. And they also wanted clinical utility information, uh, most of which um, uh, has been published by a combination of some academic laboratories, but some of it has also come from commercial laboratories, in particular one, Myriad, which uh, had had the patent and the uh, exclusive uh, testing rights for a number of years and uh, generated a fair amount of data on, um, that one could use for clinical utility arguments. And then when they put that all together and decided they were going to do it, they then had to put together some sort of a price. And the price that they put for next generation sequencing for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer panel, uh, which they said had to include at least BRCA1 and 2, but didn't specify how many other additional although genes, although those genes had to be relevant to the problem. And they priced it at $622 while continuing to pay for the, on the old BRCA1 and 2 code, well over $2,000. And um, this is, uh, I think, an interesting um, uh, situation where um, uh, you, it's very difficult to find out exactly what the basis was for them setting the, the, what I think most people would recognize as a fairly low price for the next generation sequencing approach to this. Uh, and it's still a preliminary price. It's not been um, formalized. It's not finalized. And likelihood is, is that, that, that it's going to change. But um, uh, I just found this a very interesting experience to be working with this one designated component of one designated MAC, and yet it will turn out to be probably um, th um, the most influential and important contributor to the use of, of um, next generation sequencing pay, uh, payments by Medicare and probably by a number of other payers as well if you do the testing by next generation sequencing. So the, the other thing I've learned in working with um, insurers is that there's a very complex dynamic among the concerned parties between patients and providers on the one hand, payers on the other hand, and then the laboratory, which is the rope there that's getting stretched in both directions. So the patients and providers, they are driven very heavily by personal utility concerns. Um, you know, as a practicing physician myself, uh, um, I don't always necessarily order a test just because um, I'm absolutely convinced that it has a total you know, perfect, beautiful clinical utility. Uh, also, sometimes I order a test because I'm trying to confirm a diagnosis or I'm just trying to understand and to be able to explain to a patient better why that patient may or may, or may not have a particular condition without there being a clear alteration in management that's going to happen as a result of that test. And, and patients certainly uh, often feel the same way. And they're looking to get their tests paid for by their, uh, their insurers, whereas the payers are driven by much, uh, I think, much stricter clinical utility concerns. As was said this morning, uh, they, they uh, often repeated that they did not take economic issues as being the overriding concern. They really are trying to provide good clinical care for the uh, people that they cover, but they do want good evidence, such as clinical utility. Also, many of the, provide, of the uh, payers expressed a strong interest in some kind of utilization management, similar to what has been done for drug tr treatment. They also would like for genetic testing. And um, often would engage with us about whether the laboratory could uh, partner with them 
in some way to provide some sort of utilization management to make sure, because they're quite concerned that many providers are ordering the wrong tests, they're ordering tests inappropriately, they're overusing tests, they're misinterpreting tests, and, and they would love it if um, somebody who had more knowledge and sophistication that they felt that they had would be able to partner with them to help them uh, in managing the utilization of genetic tests. And if they also expressed a lot of concern about downstream costs. I know this was mentioned this, this morning a couple of times and this afternoon as well, that, um, uh, that the inappropriate interpretation of tests, uh, for example, um, the uh, extrapolation from variants on uncertain significance, the expansion to very large panels with the number of genes that, were, that, that they considered irrelevant to the condition for which the patient was being tested, that that would, could own inevitably lead to um, excessive downstream testing, uh, which could potentially not only cost a lot of money, but also be harmful to the patients. And the laboratory wants to keep its lights on, it certainly wants to get into contract with payers. This is very helpful. And the lab also has customers. Those customers are the providers and the patients, and they want to keep them happy. And so the lab is, 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 is working hard to try to um, uh, be a partner with the payers, but at the same time serve the needs of and keeping the patients, number one, and the providers that are ordering these tests, number two, at the top of their list of the people that they're really trying to pay attention to and take care of. If you, uh, and insurers have pre their previous experience with testing. Uh, uh, colors, you know, the, 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 there's that old expression about how the generals are always fighting the last war. And I've really felt that payers have been struggling with their previous experiences with genetic testing. Number one was they have just staggered under code stacking, where there, uh, there are laboratories that would generate stacked codes for genetic testing that could go up into the tens of thousands of dollars for a test that really should only cost uh, under $1,000. Uh, and that this is something that they really feel that they got burned. They also feel they got burned badly by um, a lot of the toxicology uh, issues that have arisen recently. There's been a big boom of uh, having in-office toxicology testing, which would then be, uh, which, which, which would then be um, billed to third-party payers, and there's a whole uh, cottage industry to develop. Uh, for example, uh, you treat patients, we take care of toxicology for you. Uh, they are providers of a compliant turnkey in-office lab for clinical toxicology in specialty practices. They'll come in and install a toxicology lab in your lab. Uh, and I think that many of the insurance companies have really felt that um, this has been a real problem for them with just escalating costs for uh, drug testing. It becomes even more complex dynamic when you now add drug companies as the fourth component of this tug of war. Uh, and uh, for example, I've had some recent experience talking about LDL receptor mutation testing for hypercholesterolemia and the PCSK9 inhibitors, which are new and powerful and expensive uh, medications, where the patients and the providers uh, were looking to get their tests paid for. and um, express some resentment with the idea that a laboratory might, quote, side with the payers who are asking the laboratories to use genetic testing to limit who gets approved to get an expensive drug. While the drug companies were not necessarily interested in having genetic testing that would limit the prescription of an expensive drug. And so that the payers and the drug companies are at odds, and they're both trying to get the laboratory to side with them to either work to do the testing or not work to do the testing. And meanwhile, with the patients and the providers sort of saying, look, you know, um, whose side are you on anyway? So in summary, I think obtaining third-party payer coverage for genetic testing is a chaotic and fragmented process. Some pairs understand the field, others are clueless. There's a theoretical bar of showing true clinical utility for the individual patient, but this bar is arbitrarily and haphazardly applied or disregarded by different pairs. I can tell you over again, over and over again, that there are many examples of, of uh, tests that are done 
and sent to insurance companies and paid for, even though those insurance companies have in their official documentation that this is not a test that they will reimburse for. And yet they do, sometimes, and sometimes not. And you can't predict when it's going to happen. Uh, many payers are fighting the last war. They're worrying about panel testing because of code stacking in the past, uh, even though there are uh, uh, most laboratories now have very, very large panels and don't add additional costs if you add additional genes. And the utilization management is a mantra for uh, many payers, but its implementation is very rigid, it's bureaucratic, and it contributes unnecessarily to increased health co care costs. I mean, our, our, our prediction is that the cost of a test doubles or triples when a payer insists upon having stacks of documentation uh, which um, they could actually save administrative costs by simply accepting a much lower cost for the testing, don't demand all the administrative um, uh, um, documentation, and then, for example, did some sort of audit afterwards to determine whether, in fact, um, the laboratory was charging for what are uh, me medically appropriate uh, testing. So. I think this entire idea that one is going to require lots and lots of clinical data uh, in order to justify testing as the cost of testing comes down is going to become more and more, um, more and more uh, ar ar really archaic and unnecessary in its view. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll see what happens with that. So the, the last thing I just want to say is that um, uh, th there are a couple real standout um, third party payer efforts to try to really understand genetic testing and make it accessible to others. You know, there's um, something called Evidence Street from Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is a proprietary database of evidence, which is really, uh, really quite interesting what they tried to do. And of course, there's the Blue Cross Tech Assessment Group, which also I think has been uh, very, um, very tough and very hard nosed, but also very evidence based. And so um, uh, you know, I think there are efforts but it is very variable in its um, applicability. With that, I'm going to stop. I think I may have taken up too much time, but Mark. Thank you, Bob. Next, we have Mark Williams from Geisinger. <laughs>